Hey folks, this is Riker with another Diablo lore video. In today's episode, we discuss Act 1 of Diablo 3 and how Belial was one of the biggest shakers and movers in Sanctuary. This is part 19 of a video series in which we explore the major players in the story of Diablo, from the Nephilim to Tyriel to Deckard Cain to Diablo himself. And we give a crash course on what exactly is going on story-wise in this game series. Feel free to check out our previous episodes if you haven't, and be sure to have subscription notifications turned on so you can catch when a new episode comes out. Now before we move on, a quick word from this video's sponsor, Star Trek Fleet Command. I grew up watching Star Trek Voyager, but I also watched some TNG, Deep Space Nine, and of course, the original series. And this game hits me right in the nostalgia. Star Trek Fleet Command is a 4X MMO game that brings together over 50 years of Star Trek history, letting you recruit legendary characters and pilot iconic ships, engaging in strategic battles, and forming alliances with players around the world. And whether you're on PC or mobile, you can seamlessly connect your game and play anywhere via crossplay. The open world of the game spans the Alpha to Omega quadrants, with tons to explore, and the game is free to play, with new events and content every month. You can customize your fleet and crew, recruiting the likes of Kirk, Spock, and of course, number one himself, Commander Riker. You can pilot the Enterprise and even build a Klingon Bird of Prey or a Romulan Warbird. The story takes place in the Kelvin timeline, so you have alternate dimensions and storylines to experience. And for new players, there's a special promo code, Warp Speed. This gives you a new player content pack for free, including 10 epic shards of Kirk. As an officer, Captain Kirk is a powerful addition to any ship. To use the code, download Star Trek Fleet Command using the link in the description. Then in-game, go to your player profile in the top left, Open Settings, choose General, then scroll down to the very end to sign up for a Scopely account. Then go to the official website, StarTrekFleetCommand.com, and click the Store icon on the header to log in with your Scopely account to visit the web store. Once you're in the store, access promo codes on the left-hand menu, open the promo codes page, and lastly, enter your code Warp Speed to redeem your rewards. Once your rewards are successfully redeemed, you will then be able to see them when you go back to your game. Just a reminder though, the code only works for new players. You have to redeem it before you reach level 10. So, if you're ready to become a commander in the Star Trek universe, explore the galaxy, engage in epic space battles, and boldly go where no man has gone before, click the link in the description and start your adventure in Star Trek Fleet Command today. Live long and prosper. All right, in our last episode, we laid some of the groundwork for the story of Diablo 3, about the birth of Leah and some of the other heroes that would play a pivotal role in the story of the third installment of this franchise. We left off with Cain and Leah arriving in the town of New Tristram, and this was, in fact, only one year before the events of Diablo 3 began, so they weren't there for very long. But let's go back to Belial for a moment and his machinations. Sometime after Emperor Hakan I, ruler of Kejistan, moved the Empire's capital to Chaldeum, and after Belial hatched a plan to take over Kejistan, Hakan mysteriously grew sick and ultimately died. At that point, Zakarum priests, you know, from that religion that was completely taken over and corrupted by Mephisto in Diablo 2? Yeah. Well, Kejistan was still apparently deeply religious, so the Zakarum priests conducted elaborate rituals to determine who the next emperor would be. And that turned out to be some random poor boy from the north. He was decreed by the unfailing logic of religion to be Hakan's spiritual successor. And the Zakarum sent out the Iron Wolves to kidnap him and force him into child labor and rule the empire. You may remember the Iron Wolves from Diablo 2, a mercenary group formed by a Shira that was hunting demons in the jungles of Kurast. The Iron Wolves, unlike most mercenaries apparently, had a reputation of loyalty and duty. And apparently, uh, child abduction. So the little boy was crowned Hakan II, and as he took power in Chaldeum, the city began to decline into ruin. Because what capacity does a child have to govern a friggin' empire? I I mean, seriously. Now, it's unclear when exactly, but at some point, Belial either possessed the child or he took him out of the picture and impersonated him. Whatever it was, the outcome was the same. Belial now ruled arguably the most important empire in Sanctuary. He was kind of a Mephisto 2.0, and he was driving this empire into ruin, either intentionally or due to gross incompetence. Typical middle management, am I right? Meanwhile, Belial was enlisting what would become arguably his most powerful minions in Sanctuary, the Coven. You remember the Coven, right? The Coven was born from the remnants of the Triune, a cult that served the three primevals. 
Adria the Witch had joined the Coven for some time, becoming besties with the Witch Magda, before they had a falling out and Adria left the Coven. Well, after Adria's departure, Magda was pissed. The Coven nearly fell apart entirely, but Magda became more and more determined than ever to make contact with the Burning Hells. And, well, her hard work and persistence paid off. Belial picked up the phone. The Coven pledged themselves to his service, and Magda expanded the cult's influence to the east, into the deserts around Chaldeum, a region known as the Borderlands. No, not that one. As Chaldeum continued to crumble to ruin, the Emperor withdrew his support from the Borderlands in order to focus all efforts on maintaining the city of Chaldeum, and this allowed the Coven to swoop in and wreak havoc in the Borderlands. The Emperor sent the Iron Wolves out of the city to deal with the Coven. The Iron Wolves, who had been the protectors of Chaldeum and of the Emperor, they were being sent away, and in their stead, the Emperor formed a new cadre of Imperial Guards loyal servants of Belial that would now take up the role of protecting the city. And this is all still happening in the lead up to Diablo 3. But don't worry, don't worry, we're almost done with backstory. We just have one last domino to set up because it's the domino that kicks off the entire chain reaction, Tyrael. You see, after Tyrael destroyed the World Stone, the resulting shockwave dispersed the light and harmony of his physical form. He didn't die, but since angels are beings of light and sound, he became formless, shapeless and spent 20 mortal years restoring his physical form in Pandemonium, where the World Stone once resided. Actually, Diablo Mortal retconned that. You see, there's a sequence in Diablo Mortal in which we see that after the World Stone was destroyed, Tyrael and Bale became trapped inside one of the shards of the World Stone, caught in some perpetual battle in some kind of pocket dimension. Bale was trying to gather his strength to reconstitute himself into the mortal world, and for two years they battled, until the Shard Seeker entered this pocket dimension and fought Bale just as Tyrael was losing. Bale managed to escape and reform in Sanctuary, but then was defeated by the Shard Seeker. So, it actually doesn't matter that for a decade we've had established lore that Tyrael was reforming in Pandemonium for 20 years. It doesn't matter that there's an actual voice line in Diablo 3 in which Tyrael literally says word for word exactly what happened to him after the World Stone was destroyed and made no mention of Bale literally escaping back into the sanctuary. Uh, this is now the official canon. Tyrael just didn't think it was important to mention the whole Bale thing or uh, maybe he just didn't remember any of that. Well, regardless of what did or did not happen between Tyrael exploding the World Stone and Tyrael reforming, it was 20 years after the destruction of the World Stone that he returned to the High Heavens and summoned his sword Eldruin to his side. It was the sword was supposed to fly off, fly off the wall no, and into my. I don't have a budget for that. We. We, we don't have the special effects budget for that. He returned to the High Heavens and summoned his sword Eldruin to his side. He returned to the High Heavens and summoned his sword Eldruin to his side. Eldruin had been blasted away with the explosion of the World Stone, but remained on Sanctuary, where it went on its own little adventures, but that's a story for another time. When Tyrael returned to the High Heavens, he found that the Anduris Council, the leadership of the Angels, of which he was still a part of, had fallen into disharmony. Malthiel, Archangel of Wisdom and leader of the Council, had vanished. Imperius, Archangel of Valor and General Jackass, took over as leader becoming a tyrant. Urziel, Malthiel's most loyal servant and lieutenant, was allowed to leave heaven to go and look for Malthiel, along with a sect of angelic maidens. Tyrael suggested they try looking for Malthiel on Sanctuary since Malthiel had expressed interest in humanity before disappearing. Totally not ominous at all. Then, Tyrael was put on trial by Imperius for destroying the World Stone and interfering in mortal affairs. 
Tyrael's position was that heaven needs to team up with humanity to win the eternal conflict against hell. Also, that since he's the Archangel of Justice, you can't pass judgment on him. It's a nice little loophole you got there, Tyrael. Imperius is all, You have broken our most sacred laws. And Tyrael replies, I am the law. Tyrael then decided that if no one else in the council would take action to save humanity, he would quit. So he forsook his immortality, stripped off his wings, and became a mortal angel. Not a human, because he doesn't have any demonic essence in him, just a mortal angel. Something that never existed before and has not existed since. And he said, deuces losers, and fell from heaven down to sanctuary, accelerating to meteorite levels of velocity and appearing as a falling star to the people of sanctuary. As he fell, his sword Eldruin broke up into three pieces and scattered throughout the lands. Tyriel and Eldruin are inherently interconnected. And as the sword broke, so too did Tyriel's memories. He became an amnesiac forgetting who he was or even what his powers were. Just like every JRPG hero, Tyriel smashed down into the old Tristram Cathedral. Unfortunately, the timing wasn't great because Cain and Leah were studying when this happened in the cathedral. Leah managed to escape, but Uncle Deckard had disappeared down into the crater. But that's not all. Tyriel's destructive arrival and the magical energies he uncontrollably emanated caused the dead to rise around New Tristram. But there can be, like, no peaceful undead, so yeah, these zombies and skeletons immediately went to attack New Tristram. Alright, so that sets us up for the basic premise of Diablo 3. Fallen Star is seen throughout the world, stories of undead rising from around it, and so... What follows logically? Heroes arrive to investigate. Now, remember Vala, the demon hunter? By this point, she had slain uh, approximately a metric butt-ton of demons. She had saved villages. She was altogether quite the hero already. Now, at some point, her and her mentor, Josen, heard rumors that in seven days' time, a star would fall on Tristram. The demon hunters decided to send their best to investigate. And Vala decided that she was the best and she would go. And said, if you disagree, stop me. Josen did not stop her. Li Ming, the wizard, had heard of the fallen star in the west and met with her master Valthek in the Ashari Sanctum in Chaldeum. She told him that the prophecy of end times had come to pass and that this was her time. She was ready, but Valthek refused to let her leave. So the two dueled, like wizards do, mages, and Li Ming's uncontrollable magic destroyed part of the sanctum. After knocking Valthek unconscious, she headed to New Tristram. Meanwhile, the priests of Rothma sensed that the balance had been disturbed when they learned of the dead rising after the falling star. Master Necromancer Ordon, wielder of the blood tide blade from Diablo 3, dispatched his student, an acolyte, to travel there and put the dead back to rest. The Diablo 3 Necromancer, who was unnamed. The monk of Ivgorod, Karazim, traveled to New Tristram after the people of Ivgorod grew frightened with the coming of the fallen star. The patriarchs of Ibgarad sent Karazim to investigate. What's the deal, yo? Sonia, a barbarian from Haragath, also came to New Tristram, not for the star, but for the evil undead it had awoken. You see, following the destruction of Mount Ariat, many barbarians felt that they had failed in their sacred duty to protect the World Stone, and they left the region to battle evil wherever it may be found in the world as a form of atonement. Talk about being hard on yourself. Nazibo of the Umbaro people of the Tiganzi jungles, a people we've mentioned before, had been told by spirits of a fallen star that prophesied the end of times. Now that sounds crazy, but less so when you consider that Nazibo was a witch doctor. Witch doctors hold prestigious roles in Umbaro society. They're able to commune with the spirit world via a ghost trance. This spirit world, known as the Unformed Land, is an otherworldly plane separate from sanctuary, and it's where everyone's spirit goes when they die. You see, it's a common misconception based on real-life religion that the people of Sanctuary go to heaven or hell when they die. Uh, in fact, some people, even in Sanctuary, believe this. Propaganda from the old religions. But it cannot be possible that spirits go to heaven, because heaven and hell existed well before Sanctuary ever did, well before humans ever did. And they did not know about the existence of Sanctuary or humans for the longest time. So you can't exactly have human souls showing up in heaven for centuries without angels taking notice, you know? 
Anyway, the spirits told Nazebo to go check out the fallen star thing, so he went over to New Tristram. Now, you may also remember the Order of Crusaders we mentioned previously, holy warriors seeking to stamp out corruption wherever they find it. Learning of the fallen star and the rising dead, one crusader named Johanna ventured to New Tristram. Now, the thing about Johanna is that there's a lot of Johannas. You see, it's crusader custom for an apprentice to name themselves after their master and take up their master's armor and weapon once their master dies. You'd think, maybe get a better weapon and armor. Didn't save the master. But basically, you literally become your master. Keep passing on the name. So the most recent Johanna was born in the swamplands of Hawazar. She didn't yet have an apprentice, and when she learned about the Fallen Star, she booked it over to New Tristram so fast that she forgot her shield and flail, which we can find in Diablo 4, left behind. So anyway, all these heroes arrived in New Tristram six days after the Falling Star landed. And as per revisionist history, they all coincidentally arrived on the same day. You know, as opposed to just one of them being canonically chosen to be the hero, we'll henceforth refer to this group of heroes as the Nephilim, since Nephilim works as both a singular and plural noun. Now, Leah had led a search to find her uncle Deckard in the ruins of the cathedral, but her and the town militia were forced to retreat by all the skeletons popping up around the ruins. An undead army marched on New Tristram, and the militia held them off for six days before the Nephilim arrived and saved the day. The Nephilim then went on to rescue Deckard Cain and defeat the apparent leader of the undead, Old King Leoric, raised once more from the dead, but this time they found Leoric's old crown and used it to bind his spirit to his skeletal body, allowing the Nephilim to defeat Leoric permanently this time. Eh, we'll see about that. Now, within the cathedral, at the very center of the impact crater of the Fallen Star, the Nephilim found the mortal Tyriel, but no one realized who he was, including himself, since he had lost all his memories. While not all of his memories, he conveniently remembered that he had a sword that separated into three pieces as he fell, and the approximate places where the pieces fell. He was able to pay very close attention while skydiving down. Now, it was at this point, finally, that Leah admitted that maybe, just maybe, her uncle's crazy stories weren't as crazy as they seemed. Yeah, you see, Leah, who had seen herself protected by weird magic multiple times, who had encountered a lord of hell and his minions, who had fought skeletons and seen all kinds of strange stuff in her life, had up to now drawn the line at demons will come destroy the world one day. That one was just too far-fetched. But maybe now, maybe, she could believe in something so crazy as the apocalypse. So the Nephilim went on to try to retrieve the pieces of the sword, because well, hopefully that'll help. The thing is, though, they weren't the only ones after the sword shards. There were other shard seekers, as it were. Belial had seen Tyriel fall, and he sent Magda and the Coven to retrieve Eldruin. The Nephilim successfully retrieved the first two shards, but as they looked for the third shard in the town of Wortham, you remember Wortham, right? That quaint little fishing village that came under attack by the demon Skarn and was saved by the shard seeker? Well, the coven burned Wortham to the ground and nabbed the final piece of Eldruin, leaving the Nephilim to try to save any survivors. Meanwhile, in a two-pronged attack, the coven had also captured Decker, Cain, Tyriel, and Leah back in New Tristram. The Nephilim returned to find the coven trying to force Decker, Cain to use his spoopy heraldic magic to repair the sword. As Magda tortured Cain, Leah's defensive magic shot out, killing all the coven cultists in the room and sending Magda retreating. Leah rushed to her uncle's side, but found that he had been mortally wounded. Because apparently magic can do anything the plot demands, like somehow put an angel's sword back together, but also can't do anything when the plot demands, like staunch some bleeding. With his dying breaths, Cain cast the spell to mend the broken sword, forgetting what spell mends his broken body. He also had enough actions left on his turn to tell Leah that the amnesiac that fell from the sky was an angel. And that's how one of the most important and beloved, if not the most beloved character in Diablo history had his story come to an end. Not with the satisfying conclusion of some character arc, but as a plot device to fix the MacGuffin and propel the story into Act 2. And a butterfly lady killed him. Not that I'm bitter or anything. So they gave the angel his sword back and his memory returned. Thankfully, since his entire reason for coming down to Sanctuary was to warn everyone about an impending invasion. 
Tyrrell revealed that Belial had taken over Chaldeum and that they must head east to stop him and his minions. Now, in her grief, Leah went back to not believing Uncle Deckard's stupid stories about the apocalypse until the angel revealed himself to be Tyrrell and then she was all, oh snap, it's real. And with that, our heroes headed east. But how would our heroes be able to stop a lord of hell? What was the final great evil Asmodan up to? Would Leah ever find out the truth of her origin? All these questions and more will be answered as we continue to explore this Diablo lore video series. Stay tuned. Until then, be sure to get caught up on our past episodes. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch Patreon and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Riker's Raiders for more Diablo content.